Uh, our session is uh, uh, about building country level capacity uh, for quality improvement. Uh, we have uh, uh, three interesting uh, topics. Okay, my name is uh, uh, Frank Fuamba uh, from uh, WHO. I'm the moderator of uh, uh, this session. I say that uh, this session is about building country level capacity for uh, uh, quality improvement. We have uh, uh, three interesting uh, topics. The first is uh, uh, about addressing equity issues service access in complex environments, the case of uh, uh, South Sudan with uh, uh, Mr. Moses. Uh, the second uh, topic is about uh, development of sustainability and transition framework uh, for HIV, STI and uh, uh, TB program in South Africa with uh, Dr. Rogerio. What is Dr. Rogerio? Okay. And the last one is uh, about coordination implementation science for injectable uh, cabotegravir for PrEP. Uh, as I said, for the first presentation, the speaker is uh, Mr. Moses Gala of Intra uh, uh, Health International. Mr. Moses uh, <coughs> is an older bachelor in public health. He has a, a diploma in project management in clinical medicine and community uh, uh, health. He has more than 10 years experience in HIV uh, AIDS. Mr. Moses, you have the floor for 10 minutes. Thank you very much. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm here to share experience on addressing equity issues for HIV services access in a complex environment, the experience of South Sudan. Next slide, please. Do you have some technical challenges? Apologies for those hiccups.
Next slide, please. Yeah, in terms of our presentation outline, we are going to look at the background, project scope, methodology, the package of intervention with interest in the female sex workers, results, lesson learned, challenges, and way forward. In informal background, South Sudan as a country has an estimated population of 12 million, with the estimated people living with HIV at 164,000. As of 2022, we have 52,692 persons that are on antiretroviral therapy. The gap tells us the existing inequities. And as a country, the HIV epidemic is generalized with a significant variation within and among the states and also among the subpopulations. Previous biobehavioral surveillance surveys that were conducted with support from CDC, Ministry of Health through Intra, Intra Health, in selected towns within the Republic of South Sudan, puts the HIV prevalence among the female sex workers at 23%, compared to the general population prevalence of 2%. Today, as countries are celebrating gains in realizing the achievement of the 1995 UNAIDS global target, countries like Zimbabwe, Botswana, but South Sudan as a country still lags behind. In terms of progress, the first 95 is at 40%, the second is at 32, and the third is at 27%. The country had experienced double shocks of conflict, 2013 and 2016. The environment still remains fragile, and it lacks basic infrastructure with the many families living below the poverty line. The socioeconomic environment makes women very vulnerable, and this contributes to engagement in sex work. Like other countries, sex work in South Sudan is illegal, and it attracts sociocultural condemnation within and among communities. And that alone means that sexual criminalization arrest and money extortion exist within and from the authorities within the country, including gender-based violence, and that widens the inequity issues. Next slide. At the project level, IntraHealth International is privileged with support from USAID to implement a project called Advancing HIV AIDS Epidemic Control, targeting general population and the key population. And the key population in this aspect, based on the context, looks at the female sex workers and their clients. And the project level, looking at the HIV, uh, general HIV service intervention, it is in 14 primary healthcare facilities. 10 of those uh, facilities are in one of the counties within one state, and four of those facilities are in two of the counties within one state, that is Western Equatorial State. For the KP project activities, it is implemented in six towns of the 10 states of the Republic of South Sudan. And within the six sites or six towns, we have an estimated population of the female sex workers at 12,715. This is based on the micro-planning data that is conducted by annual by the project teams. Looking at the context in an environment where no drop-in centers are allowed to cascade or implement HIV intervention for key population. You are only allowed to do integration to the existing public health facilities. How do you navigate? The navigation is in the sense that we do targeted community-based 
interventions to the female sex workers, you identify and you train them as peer educators and peer navigators to at least mobilize and make sure that they refer their peers to the establishments when outreaches are organized. And we continue to conduct biannual key population hotspot mapping to at least provide for us a denominator to leverage our planning intervention for the outreach intervention. And equally at leadership level, we engage with the South Sudan AIDS Commission through the national security to secure letters of authorization as a means of community entry process alongside doing advocacy to make sure that the leadership comes to term to understand the epidemic situation within the country and try to see what best can be done to the subpopulation that may be at elevated risk of the infection. Equally, in our intervention, we make sure that we provide uh, comprehensive services integrating sexual and reproductive health and HIV services. And also we review to make sure that we really understand in terms of scale, how are we doing in our intervention. And in the scope of this presentation, we are looking at one year event of our programming. Next slide. The package of the intervention that we provide is aligned to the WHO recommendation of the behavioral, biological, and the structural intervention to make sure that the interventions are handy and to meet the needs of the female sex workers where they stay at their convenience. Next slide. Looking at the results, within that one year, we, as I mentioned, we don't have drop-in centers. The interventions are planned in a way that you work alongside the, the public health facilities for aspect of bio referrals, community facility level to enhance appropriate linkage. And that comes with a lot of challenge. But we are here to, to really pronounce and make sure that based on the complexity of the environment, we are able to test Eight thousand eight hundred and seventy-seven, and we identified seven hundred and sixty-one positive, putting a positivity rate of eight point five percent. And looking at quarterly trends, the quarterly trends stand up at above uh, nine percent, and that tells us in terms of what we really need to be different to make sure that nobody is left behind. Equally, in terms of linkage. We make sure that all those who have been identified HIV positive are linked from the facility. We work alongside the facility teams to make sure that they are initiated on ART on site and supported to make sure that they continue with their refills at the facility level. And the team continues to engage in terms of good coordination and collaboration to make sure that the HIV cascade is enhanced in terms of appropriate linkage, retention, viral load services, and also the psychosocial support. At program level, we also try to engage and try to see in terms of the positivity, which age categories are at a higher risk so that in terms of our intervention, we can really plan and cascade our interventions appropriately in terms of service provision. Next slide. This demonstrates aspect of comprehensiveness of the service. When you are going to the community, you don't only go and provide HIV testing. You need to look at the other package to make sure that SDI screening, family planning, gender-based violence, including the new uh, PrEP interventions are provided. And this shows the comprehensiveness, regardless of absence of centers that may be there at the community, but you navigate to make sure that the bilateral referral community facility is enhanced so that at least the services are comprehensive and those in need of the services are provided when and where they need them. Next slide. In terms of lessons learned, we learned that provision of services on site at the community level is visible and cost effective and uses of peers 
is very successful in increasing reach to the target population. And equally, we need to really leverage and make sure that we fully integrate our services to make sure that community facility uh, bilateral referral is enhanced in terms of system. And we need not to forget that engagement with the national security leadership is very key alongside advocacy with the key government authorities to really sustain our efforts in the intervention. We have challenges, flooding, insecurity, accessing the sites becomes a nightmare. And this contributes to issues related with the stockouts of drugs, mobility of the female sex workers, and sometimes they move to sites where we don't have presence. And that becomes very difficult because where they are, interventions may not be provided. And equally, the conflict zone poses a huge kind of threat. And as I mentioned, absence of drop-in centers that other countries are benefiting because it provided easy service intervention misses. And for us as a country, we try to leverage on what is available because we know that you need to invest on what is available and try to make sure that you build your resources on it. Next slide. In terms of conclusion, we learned that capitalizing on program synergies can produce the best possible HIV outcome. And equally, we need purposeful leadership direction. With that purposeful leadership direction in terms of engagement, it becomes a nightmare in terms of issues related with the violence. And we also know that research program reviews is very important to inform, not only doing research, not only doing program reviews, but actualizing the data to make sure that the data is used handy to inform program implementation. Next slide. Next slide, please. I thank you so much and allow me appreciate the leadership of the Republic of South Sudan, Minister of Health, South Sudan AIDS Commission, HEFA through USAID for supporting intra health to make sure that activities are implemented to the vulnerable population amidst the existing challenges within the country. I thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Moses. Uh, with Moses, we have seen how we, uh, it is possible to have uh, many and uh, better achievements regardless of the context. Everyone knows the context of uh, uh, South Sudan. The second speaker is uh, Dr. Ruggiero. He will talk about development of uh, national sustainability and transition from work for HIV, STI, and TB program in a, a South African, a multisectorial approach. Dr. Rogero is uh, uh, the executive manager of uh, resource mobilization and donor coordination uh, at the uh, SANAC. He possesses several qualifications, including a master's degree in health uh, promotion, and PhD uh, in public health from uh, University of KwaZulu Natal. He has uh, uh, more than 20 years' experience in various aspects of HIV, TB, and uh, STI management. Dr. Rogero, you have 10 minutes. No, thank you very much, uh, Program Director. So I will uh, try to. Uh, rush through the slides uh, to cover the 10 minutes. Um, and uh, good morning, uh, colleagues. So I'm going to be uh, presenting to you uh, what we regard as a best practice in terms of the development of a country level uh, plan uh, for sustainability of um, uh, donor funded uh, programs in South Africa. So in the next slide, um, uh, the uh, program director has already indicated that I come from NEC in South Africa, which we call uh, SANAC. It is the same version of NEC that exists in the other countries. 
just to say that um, uh, the SANAC was formed by a, a cabinet uh, sometime in early 2000 uh, to drive the multi-sectoral uh, coordination of the HIV, TB and SCI response in the country uh, in line with what uh, we know as UNH31's principle uh, that uh, prescribes that countries should have an agreed HIV and AIDS action framework uh, uh, through one structure and with one uh, uh, MNE system, so one coordination body as well as uh, one MNE system, and in South Africa that occurs through SANAC. And there's already evidence that um, without uh, this structure, the implementation of the programs in the country would have been uh, fragmented and there would have been no room for participation of stakeholders like civil society and the private sector in a coordinated fashion. Uh, the next slide, I'm not going to dwell into it, but it just explains um, how the uh, next structure works in the country, that it's chaired at the highest level by the deputy president of the country and through an extended uh, plenary uh, that consists of government uh, stakeholders, civil society and the private sector. And um, there are some subcommittees that work uh, uh, under that uh, structure. For example, the Resource Mobilization Committee, as well as other committees like Program Review uh, Committees. The same structure is replicated at sub-national level or provinces, where the Provincial Council on AIDS are the ones that drive it with the premiers of, of the provinces. And uh, the chairing happens with the uh, civil society uh, leadership. Uh, the structure is supported by a secretariat, which is where I come from, that provides the secretariat function to the SANAC structure. So with the issue at hand today, why do sustainability planning? Uh, and we present here the uh, proposed uh, format that we had followed. Uh, part of the work of SANAC on NEC is to develop the national strategic plan for HIV and AIDS and TB. Uh, at this stage, we are um, uh, implementing the NSP, if I can abbreviate it, NSP for 2023 to 2028 uh, with four goals. And one of those goals, which is goal number four, already prescribed that the country should be regularly developing sustainability and transitional plans uh, that are routinely monitored to ensure that we maintain uh, the programs that we offer, especially the ones that are funded by the donors. Uh, post the donor transition. Um, why then would you have a, a framework to guide that? It is because uh, many people interpret uh, sustainability issues differently. Um, so if you have a country level framework, then you have a structured approach of engaging on a broad range of uh, sustainability topics. You build a common understanding uh, of the interpretation of the sustainability issues so that everybody talks about the same thing when they refer to sustainability issues for the HIV and TB programs in the country. The risks that we had identified for us to have a, a framework was that we noticed that uh, for some of the programs, especially the prevention ones, there was a high dependence on the donor funding. Uh, some programs almost exclusively uh, funded by the donors an example of that will be the pre-exposure prophylaxis, as well as uh, the VMMC program at the time, uh, which had, um, although there was government funding, but it was at a limited uh, scale. And also there is a question of uh, the insufficient domestic funding uh, that was not allocated towards the HIV programming in the country. And uh, with the dependence on the donors for some of the programs, there needs to be a guidance document for uh, the domestic funding as well as uh, other donors in terms of what are the key things that they need to do if they come and implement uh, programs in the country. And we also know that uh, some of the programs were delivered in a vertical fashion in the country. Uh, even the ARV treatment is one of them. Uh, the prevention of mother to child transmission is another one that were uh, uh, implemented as a result of court action or uh, civil society pressure. And hence, there was no time to integrate it within the existing PHC uh, services. And hence, then they were implemented in a vertical manner so that there can be a rapid scale up at the time. And hence, that poses its own risk, which we are trying to address with the sustainability framework. 
uh, in the next slide. I think we are in a slide that says who should lead sustainability planning. So in the next one. So uh, yes, this is a big question then because uh, given the issues that I've indicated uh, in most of the countries, South Africa is lucky in the fact that most of the funding for the uh, NSP responses comes from the government. Except about approximately 70% of the funding comes from the government, but there is that percentage that comes from international donors, uh, mainly PEFA and the Global Fund, but there are others as well. And hence then the conversations regarding sustainability, we noted that some of them were being led by the donors uh, because they needed to have some form of sustainability prescripts in their programs, but uh, there was nothing that uh, the country had so that they could align with the country and hence then the sustainability uh, framework had to be developed. Uh, so the conversations uh, could not be led by the government departments alone, given the multi sectoral uh, response that HIV and TB issues are. Although, as I've indicated, most of the funding is allocated by Treasury, you also can have Treasury leading the discussions because uh, one, they have limited jurisdiction in terms of the operations of the different departments, even health, as well as um, also for the community-based programs. They do not have much control over those ones. And most of the issues that require sustainability are social and structural uh, drivers of the three diseases, and those uh, have limited uh, leadership from uh, Treasury. Uh, also, if you allocate the responsibility to the Department of Health, for example, that department has equal standing as other role players in the HIV response. So, for example, in our country, we also have the Department of Social Development that drives the issues uh, that address uh, social and structural drivers. So you cannot have one department then that exercise control over the other departments. So these, amongst other factors, then places the responsibility, in our opinion, to uh, develop the sustainability uh, planning by the next of the country, which then in our case was done by uh, SANAC. Um, but in doing so, uh, you we also acknowledge that you need people that have technical capacity in terms of health financing and the other uh, programmatic issues to drive the coordination of the framework. So we then set up a multi-sectoral uh, technical working group that was going to provide oversight in terms of the development of the framework, as well as its monitoring and provincial uh, uh, implementation as well, because the first exercise was to focus at developing sustainability framework at national level, but then the next exercise is that you want to also do that at sub-national levels. So on your left-hand side, you can see then the composition of that technical working group that we've, uh, we had established, uh, and you can see that its representativity covers uh, stakeholders from government, civil society, even the development partners, uh, some of them that don't only provide support with regards to financial resources, but also uh, with regards to the technical support. I think you've moved to the next slide, which Jan, no, no, the one previous to that one, uh, the approach. So when we started this exercise in 2021, because the plan that we developed was for 2021 to 2023, there were not many uh, models that we could look at. So we started from the scratch of looking worldwide, uh, reviewing literature published and unpublished, uh, to look at how uh, to develop the best uh, sustainability framework. We also did some public and targeted consultations with the experts. Uh, there were uh, meetings that were held with the provinces or, uh, to agree on the sustainability definitions as well as the domains of sustainability because we were clear that you cannot only look at the issues of sustainability based on the finances. There are other issues that you need to consider. So if you look at the next slide, then after the exercise, we then, uh, based on all the review that we had done, identified six domains of sustainability for the country. Uh, I'm not going to go through each one of them because of time limitations, but you can see that financial sustainability is one of the aspects. Uh, we also looked at the issues of epidemic control service delivery issues, the political leadership, all of this 
uh, that we benchmarked to see that those are the components that need to inform an effective sustainability framework. So what we were able to achieve then is the sustainability technical working group, which was the beginning step that I've talked about. We now had uh, the next slide, um, the national sustainability framework for 2021 to 2024, uh, which also included tools uh, that were going to be used by the provinces in terms of developing their own local sustainability and transitioning planning. Uh, which is a process that I've indicated is driven at sub-national level by the Provincial Council on AIDS. So we also manage in the new national strategic plan to include a sustainability chapter so that the country is guided in terms of what is it that they need to do when doing HIV and TB programming to include the issues relating to sustainability. In red there, we've indicated the, the two indicators that uh, are defined in terms of the NSP for monitoring the sustainability progress in the country. Uh, I'm going to skip the next slide and move to the one, uh, to the next one. No, no, the one that says sustainability planning, that one, yes. Just to briefly explain then that uh, it's all well and good to uh, have the plan, uh, a well-consulted plan. Uh, everybody has buy-in in terms of the plan, but it can easily find its way into a shelf uh, and not uh, being uh, used. So the next uh, process that we are in the uh, process of doing is to institutionalize the sustainability framework, which means to mainstream it within the government planning and budgeting processes. So the first step we think we have achieved, of course, the national uh, strategy, uh, framework has been included in the NSP which is a guidance document for all the implementers. Then as we move to do the provincial uh, uh, strategic plans, we are also including the provincial level sustainability issues into those plans as well. But ultimately, all the business plans that the provinces submit to Treasury for funding of the HIV programs should uh, have the sustainability uh, issues outlined in them and then funded. And that is one way we're going to maintain the uh, mainstreaming of the sustainability. And that is the process that we are currently engaging other departments like Treasury to do. So in terms of the next steps, um, uh, we've got a national plan. We are busy now trying to align it with the new NSP because the plan that we had was for 2021 to 2023. Our new NSP is from 2023 up to 2028. Uh, that is the process that we are doing. Once that is done, because we've already uh, used the tools that we've developed to assess the national level programs using the same uh, uh, framework, we are going to move that process now to the provinces to have all the nine provinces having their own uh, sustainability plans as well as the transitioning plan in terms of withdrawal or reduction of uh, donor funding in the main. Um, but we must also indicate that um, a part of the exercise is to ensure that there are regular assessment of the sustainability issues because those change from time to time. We saw even during COVID how the donor priorities changed. Uh, some of the uh, programs that had been funded had to be reprioritized to cover, to mitigate the uh, COVID implications. Hence, then you cannot have a static uh, framework. It needs to be updated from time to time. So in conclusion, we are saying that utilizing the multi-sector technical working group is an ideal way of achieving an inclusive sustainability framework for donor funding in the country, as well as for government-led programs. Uh, but you need technically able members to ensure that the plan is developed and that there are regular assessments that are done. Uh, and you require similar structure and arrangements at sub-national level and we advocate that for the countries that have got uh, uh, the subnational next, that process is better led through those structures. So thank you, Chair. Thank you, uh, Dr. Uh, Ruggiero. Dr. Ruggiero uh, was sharing about uh, uh, how we can integrate in the same framework 
uh, HIV and uh, uh, tuberculosis service uh, and uh, uh, obtain encouraging results. The last uh, uh, presentation is about coordination implementation science for injectable calibugavir for PrEP. The speaker is uh, uh, Catherine Verde. Catherine Verde uh, is a program manager of uh, the product introduction and access uh, team at uh, AVAC. Prior to joining AVAC, Catherine uh, uh, worked for uh, M MSC and uh, she provides direct technical support across uh, more than 20 countries in Africa and Asia. Catherine, you have the floor. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Catherine Verdi Hashim. Um, as mentioned, I'm program manager at AVAC, and today I'm going to be presenting on coordinating implementation science for CAB for PrEP Biopex implementation study tracker. Next slide, please. Okay, so we'll start with some context. What is cabotegravir and why is a study tracker needed? Cabotegravir, or CAB for PrEP, is a two month intramuscular injection developed by Viv Healthcare. The HIV Prevention Trials Network 083 and 084 studies found it both safe and effective as HIV prevention for adult cisgender men and women and transgender women, leading to approval by the U.S. Food and Drug Administration in December 2021 and by 11 additional countries and the European Medicines Agency as of December 2023. You can see here a map showing in green where CAB for PrEP is approved and in blue where there are submissions pending. And it's important to clarify that just because the local regulator has approved a product does not mean it's available to users yet. Implementation research projects are underway to assess the delivery and uptake of CAB for PrEP in real world conditions across diverse populations, including populations not included in the original trials, such as pregnant and lactating people and transgender men. To support a successful scale up, Biopic is coordinating across implementing partners to address research gaps avoid duplication, promote cross-learning, and incorporate lessons from oral prep. Next slide, please. So what is Biopic? Biopic was formed in response to a problem, the inefficient rollout of oral prep. The introduction and scale-up of oral prep was hindered by lack of coordination, slow regulatory approvals, low community awareness and acceptance, and inefficient delivery models, which led to delays in access to an effective method of HIV prevention. In addition, post-approval evidence generation was splintered across 131 small-scale projects, many of which were poorly timed and not designed to address key decision-maker questions within a fragmented and complex stakeholder landscape. To address these challenges, the Biomedical Prevention Implementation Collaborative, or BIOPIC, was formed in 2018. BIOPIC's objective is to coordinate successful and rapid introduction of new biomedical HIV prevention options leveraging lessons from the oral PrEP rollout and starting with CAB for PrEP. It regularly brings together over 100 HIV prevention experts, including civil society representatives, donors, researchers, policymakers, normative agencies, and implementers from over 20 countries. And it also serves as the secretariat of the coalition to accelerate access to long-acting PrEP. Next slide, please. So how does Biopic coordinate implementation under Biopic, AVAC and the WHO regularly convene partners through virtual think tanks to identify and address priority CAB for PrEP evidence gaps and define the implementation science agenda. The first Biopic think tank in 2021 was used to identify priority areas for evidence generation, and subsequent think tanks have used this list in conjunction with the WHO's priority CAB for PrEP research list to guide which topics are selected for discussion. These priorities include Use patterns, particularly focused on populations not included in clinical trials, such as pregnant and lactating populations, and looking at safety, efficacy, and how best to deliver acceptable services. Demand generation and ways to promote choice in a multi-product market. Service delivery models, optimal models to reach different groups, including novel delivery channels, such as pharmacies, and also looking at costing of various models and delivery to various populations and monitoring and evaluation strategies, including looking at PrEP indicators. 
These think tanks are complemented by Biopic's role as a clearinghouse to track and analyze implementation research projects using the publicly available Implementation Study Tracker, found on prepwatch.org studies, ensuring priority evidence gaps are being addressed and avoiding the silos and duplication seen in the early implementation of oral prep. Next slide, please. So now let's take a look at what trends we are seeing in the CAB for PrEP implementation science landscape as outlined in the study tracker. And we'll start with geography. As of December 2023, there are 34 known planned and ongoing CAB for PrEP implementation science studies. You can see the map of studies here with the numbers on the map showing how many studies are taking place in each country. And I note that several studies are taking place in more than one country, so the map will add up to more than 34. You can see from the bar graph on the right with number of studies by region that the studies are highly concentrated in East and Southern Africa with 19 in the region and 11 in South Africa alone. The country with the next highest number is the US with six. This concentration East and Southern Africa aligns with epidemiological need as the region has the highest rate of HIV incidence per HIV negative population with one new infection per 1,000 seronegative people in 2022 as per UNAIDS. Next slide, please. Now we'll have a look at which populations are included in these studies. Gay and bisexual men who have sex with men and trans women are well represented and included in studies across nearly all regions. Adolescent girls and young women and pregnant and lactating populations are also well represented, particularly in studies in East and Southern Africa, in line with epidemic demographics. In 2022, there were 130,000 new HIV infections amongst adolescent girls and young women in East and Southern Africa, the most of any region by a significant margin. Studies including sex workers are also concentrated in East and Southern Africa, which again is in line with geographical HIV prevalence amongst this population. Trans men and gender non-conforming people are less represented in CAB for PrEP implementation science studies, despite the known heightened HIV risk amongst trans men. And there are only two studies which include people who use and inject drugs, one in the United States and the other in Vietnam. And I note that no studies feature people who are incarcerated. Next slide, please. Now have a look at sample sizes. At the moment, 30 of 34 studies have established sample sizes. You can see from the graphics here that the overwhelming majority of studies have fewer than 1,000 participants. There are only five studies with over 5,000 participants. And order from the largest to smallest studies, these are Theta Nami Negatete Nawe, or Let's Talk, and Lapis, run by the Africa Health Research Institute and featuring 26,000 participants in South Africa. Fast Prep, run by the Desmond Tutu Health Foundation, featuring 25,000 participants in South Africa. Catalyst, run by FHI and the Mosaic Consortium, with 11,000 participants spread across Kenya, Lesotho, South Africa, Uganda, and Zimbabwe. Paths to Scale for Kabale in Malawi, run by the Blantyre Prevention Strategy, featuring 10,000 participants in Malawi. And Project Prep, run by VITS RHI, featuring 7,500 participants in South Africa. Most of these studies plan to run 2023 to 2025, dependent on approvals and availability of CAB supply. Next slide, please. So why does any of this matter and why is tracking this information so important? Inclusion of diverse geographies and populations in implementation studies is crucial to generate evidence on safety, acceptability, delivery, and uptake in real-world settings. Biopic, through its role as a central coordinating mechanism supported by the Implementation Study Tracker, can help ensure research is organized for maximum impact and efficiency and identify where evidence is lacking to ensure that no populations that could benefit from CAB for PrEP are left behind. This is particularly significant in consideration of the current limitations on supply of CAP for PrEP. It's critical to ensure the supply available can be directed to help answer priority research questions and reach those who can most benefit. You can see in the graph here the current allocation of CAP for PrEP supply for the period 2023 to 2025. There are 1.2 million doses being made available, thanks to an additional 365,000 recently announced and committed to by the manufacturer V. Of this 1.2 million, 129,000, or just under 11%, has been earmarked for implementation science studies. This isn't a lot, so it's important that it goes to where it is most needed, and Biopic can help ensure that happens. Next slide, please. So finally, what next for Biopic? 
There's a wide range of new prep methods um, in the pipeline, either just coming to market or expected to market soon, which you can see here. Over the next five years, we're expecting and hoping to see the rollout of the Depivirine Vaginal Ring, CAB for PrEP, Injectable and Acapivir for PrEP, Daily Oral FTAF for Cisgender Women, Multipurpose Prevention Technology, such as the Dual Prevention Pill, and potentially even a monthly oral pill. As these products come to market, Biopic's role as a coordination mechanism and clearinghouse for implementation studies will gain even greater significance. As mentioned, implementation studies provide valuable real-world data. This enables implementers to support users in choosing the most suitable PrEP option for their needs and in establishing best practices on how to do this will increase the likelihood of users identifying and adopting a method that aligns best with their lifestyle preferences. This will improve adherence and coverage while promoting a diverse PrEP market for informed choice. Next slide, please. Thank you for listening. And I have a list of resources here for when the presentations are disseminated. And please don't forget you can find the study tracker at prepwatch.org slash study. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Catherine. Uh, she uh, showed us the importance of uh, the implementation science to contextualize uh, each intervention using uh, uh, the Cabotegravir model in PrEP with uh, all of the uh, key populations. 